value your prayers just this morning as I really believe the Lord's laid something on my heart just to share with us and uh, I've been wrestling with it for a while now and uh, but so I'm just going to do as best as I can um, this morning and uh, I thank God for many confirmations as we go along um, as I pray and I seek the Lord's face you know either through discussions or things he shows me in the word and spending time in his presence but if there's a title for it this morning, and, I, and I, I'm so grateful for Richard, obviously been praying and, and the Lord laid upon his heart these songs this morning, you know, um, in a time when we are focusing on the first coming of Jesus, and almost every church up and down the country now would be singing Christmas carols already, over and over and over. Not that I have anything against Christmas carols, I know some of them go a little bit off tangent sometimes. But I find it just so amazing that the Lord even stirred Richard to focus on the second coming. And you know, it's so important. And if there's a title for the message this morning, it's a kingdom not of this world. And please would you turn with me to John chapter 18. Uh, the last time I was with you, we finished off on Song of Solomon. And we focused on the jealousy of God and the Spirit of God longing jealously for His church, His bride. And... Uh, we must never forget that as we go along. John, chapter, the Gospel of John, chapter 18, please. And we'll pick it up from verse 28, but let me just pray and ask the Lord to help me this morning. Lord, as I come before you this morning. I thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit. I even thank you for the song selection this morning that you led by your Spirit. This, these are the songs you wanted us to sing this morning, and I give you praise for that this morning. Lord, to help us to focus on you and the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you that, Lord, you have ushered in, as it were, a new kingdom, Lord, a kingdom not of this world, that we can be part of this great and awesome kingdom, Lord, even now, as it were, by your Holy Spirit, to taste and to see and the powers of the age to come. And Lord, we want to come this morning around your word. Lord, I, I just lay down before you this burden that you've put upon my heart, the burden of the word of the Lord. And I lay it at your feet, Lord. We just want to hear from you this morning. Not a man. We want to hear from you. Lord, would you lead us this morning by your spirit, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So in some shape and form, friends, this is... Um, been something I've been through a few times, I think, already. But, you know, sometimes the Lord just takes you back, and He takes you back, and He takes you back. And how many times, even as parents, we know with our own children, you've got to repeat yourself, and repeat yourself, <laughs> and repeat. And sometimes you feel like you're just hanging on by your fingernails, and then finally they get it. And they're like, oh, that's a really good idea. <laughs> and you feel utterly exhausted. And I'm sure we've all experienced that for those of you that are, you know, if you run a business and you work with employees or anything like that, you know, you know how hard it is sometimes to bring people along with you. And we are just like that with the Lord. You know, we are his sheep. And we need the good shepherd to lead us. And aren't you glad that he's patient? Yeah. <laughs> there are many shepherds, under shepherds, if you like, pastors out there in the world that are called heavy shepherds. They don't represent the Lord Jesus rightly because they're impatient and they allow the flesh to get in the way. And in many times, even I, you know, you feel like, oh, I get so frustrated, Lord, we just don't get it. <laughs> but then you look to the good shepherd and he's always patient and he's always kind. And he's always merciful, and he's always longing for us to come back to him. And you know, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is this, where Jesus has come to the end of his earthly life, as we shall be looking at in a moment. And you see everything come to a, I don't want to say a conclusion, but it comes to this crescendo, if you like, this great event in human history when the Son of God laid down his life for a wayward people. And everything leading up to it, all the prophecies, the many, many prophecies that were fulfilled almost minute by minute, it, it is not possible for a human being to have orchestrated that. A phenomenal event in human history that we will remember for all of eternity. Because we are the redeemed, yeah? Fallen creatures but we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So this is a, a, a 
monumental <laughs> event. And we're going to remember that this morning as we take communion. So we'll just read from verse 28, John chapter 18. And this is Jesus now being led before Pilate and the rulers of the day. And, uh, you know, always good for you to read these things, as the Bible teachers would tell us, synoptically, you read it through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's gospel is different in the sense it was written much later, and he's got a big, you know, theological message, as do the others, but, you know, John is writing very much almost in hindsight and brings out a lot of the irony and the theology and the depth of various things as he brings out the gospel message. And in verse 28, it says, Then they, lay, uh, they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. And for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you, uh, at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber, and the other Gospels tell us he was a murderer and a part of a great rebellion. Going into chapter 19 then, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to, him, said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greatest sin. 
From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered, them, delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing the cross, went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote the title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic, tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. And they, uh, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Amen. We'll just read up to there. It's just good for us to get the context around all that is happening here. I find this one of the most profound, powerful uh, communications, if you like, of our King. And remember now, just before Jesus had come to this place, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I trust you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well. And you see, as they've come to arrest Jesus in the Garden, and remember what Peter did to stand in the gap, if you like, to defend the Lord Jesus. What did he do? He took out the sword and he cut off the ear of one of the servants. Yeah? And righteous zeal that was burning in his heart, thinking he's doing Jesus a great favor. I am not going to let them take my Lord away from me with this violence. And in stepped Peter and cut off the ear. And what did Jesus do? He put the man's ear back miraculously and rebuked Peter for it. And it's an amazing, amazing thing. Everything was going according to plan. Although the disciples were a bit slow on the uptake, if you like. But everything was happening according to plan. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Please have a look with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Right at the end of 1 Timothy. Paul is writing to the young pastor at Ephesus called Timothy. And he says to him in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, he says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. What things? He's just talking to him about error and greed and all kinds of things, the love of money and uh, uh, all these things and the useless wranglings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. All this corrupt Christianity, okay, that we see so much of even in our time. He says, but you, man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. My friends, this is a message that the Lord has put on my heart that is burning so. And it's something that I feel we have neglected as the church of God and we've overlooked. We are fighting the wrong fight 90% of the time. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you also, uh, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time, as we were singing this morning. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Powerful words by the Apostle Paul, urging a young pastor, friends, a young shepherd if you like. But you, O oh man of God, don't be like these corrupt people. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. I hope this morning I can just relay to you in some shape or form in my clumsy way that we are, it's imperative for us to come back to the simplicity of the gospel. We are fighting many things out there, friends, and we get frustrated by many things out there. It is not our fight. It is not our fight. <laughs> you know, Peter, I mean, if we were there, we would have been urging him on. Come on, Peter, you're the bold one. Take that sword, chop off his ear. Well done, Peter. When our Lord says, no, that's not the way. Trust and wait. Fight the good fight of faith. But notice that he says here to him, this good confession. What is this good confession? Verse uh, 15, uh, sorry, verse um, 13. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. This good confession, friends, this whole thing we just read in John's gospel. Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the secular leader of the day. <laughs> what is the good confession? Jesus didn't say much. In fact, Pilate got frustrated, and you want to answer him. If you read the other Gospels, it says he marveled every time he asked him questions, and Jesus would not answer. And they are bringing vile accusations against him. And he just keeps silent. And Pilate marvels. What is this? And if you read the Gospels in Luke, you'll see that even Pilate's own wife had a dream about this Jesus and said, have nothing to do with this man. <laughs> There's something going on with this man. And so he's got this niggling fear inside of him. And then all of a sudden he hears the Jews saying he's calling himself the son of God. Now we've got to remember that in, even in Pilate's times, you know, they were very open to gods, pagan gods and the supernatural, if you like. And so when they start saying his wife had this strange dream, and now all of a sudden, he's making himself out to be the son of God. You can imagine how they grip Pilate's heart. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> hang on, son of a God? Who is this? He goes back to Jesus. Who? Oh, where are you? He actually asks him, where are you from? <laughs> you see? Are you beginning to recognize you're not from around here. Where are you from? And Jesus gives him, as it were, the silent treatment. But I love... I love when Pilate asked him in verse 35, 18 verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered and said to him, My kingdom is not of this world. That's not changed. <laughs> That's not changed. Jesus redeemed us by his own blood, my friends. Not for this kingdom of this world. It's for a kingdom that's not of this world. And when we come together as believers in Christ Jesus and we sense his presence with us, even in our worship, these are little small foretastes, if you like, of what's coming. I love that in Daniel chapter 2, isn't it, when Nebuchadnezzar has that dream of that image. Remember, we've been through that. All the world kingdoms. All of them represented in that statue. We're not part of any of those. 
<laughs> okay? There's a stone that is hewn without hands that comes and it smashes that image to bits all of human history. And this stone grows, <laughs> and it grows throughout the whole earth. It is the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom we're part of. Yet we find ourselves in this wretched, <laughs> dark, miserable, fallen and corrupt world where people just bent on evil and bent on rebellion. I love what Jesus says. My kingdom is not of this world. If, <laughs> if my kingdom were of this world, Pilate, my servants would fight. Pilate's thinking, who is this man? What's going to happen here? Jesus says to him, if my kingdom were of this world, my servant would fight so that I would not be delivered to, uh, to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So because his kingdom is not from here, his servants don't fight. <laughs> Even though Peter kind of stepped out for a little bit and did fight, Jesus rebuked him sharply. My friends, this has not changed throughout history. This has not changed. We are his disciples, filled with the spirit of Jesus. Do you believe that this morning? That scripture said, Christ in me, the hope of glory. The Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't change. We change. <laughs> he doesn't. He is the same Lord Jesus that said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is not of this world. We are passing through. We are passing through, friends. And I love when Pilate asked him in chapter, verse 10 of verse, chapter 19. Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? <laughs> the authority? You're not answering me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And indeed, he does have that power. Jesus didn't question that power. That's very important for us to take note of, friends. Jesus did not question that power. He only said to them, you could have no power. <laughs> Just let me help you understand something a little bit better, Pilate. You could have no power against, at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Okay, and you can go up to Caesar and all those, but ultimately, where does the power and authority come from? It comes from God, our Father, <laughs> who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our kingdom, friends. The more we've been going the long, the Lord has been showing me he's grieved for his church. We are worrying about all kinds of things. We are fighting battles, my friends. <laughs> that is not ours to fight. Come back to the simplicity of the gospel. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. No, his kingdom is not of this world. Stop the fight. Lay down the guns. <laughs> Put away your sword. Hold up the sword of the spirit. Come back to the simplicity of the gospel. No authority unless it had been received from above. This is so important for us to understand. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tension amongst believers today because we see what is happening in the world and we are rightly concerned. Okay, We see a globalization of everything taking place. I was just talking to Nathan, my son, this week. And we were talking about the Tower of Babel. And you know, we're the only generation ever since the Tower of Babel where language is no longer an issue. What a sign, if you like. When God said, even at the Tower of Babel, pre that, when they're all of one mind, one language, surely there's nothing these human beings can do if they don't put their minds to it. Let, let us go down and confound them, their languages, and they dispersed. Now we're living in a time language is no longer that barrier. 
Things are escalating. Knowledge is increasing. We are living in the last of the last days. Things are happening. We look at prophecy. We look at end time events. And we can see, oh my, mark of the beast things. This is like on the door, yeah? And we see these things. And of course, we gripped in our hearts. And we see things begin to develop and trends you know, uh, emerge. And we want to begin to resist. I see this thing, Jesus and Pilate, kind of playing out again in the last days. Thinking we are doing God a favor in fighting when everything is going according to plan. God is in control. We are not going to stop the beast coming. We're not going to stop the mark of the beast. We can only stop people taking the mark of the beast. And I'm so grateful that even when that time comes, my Bible tells me there will even be angels flying to and fro, urging people, don't take this mark. Because when you do, that is it for you. Don't be deceived that it is anything else. Okay? Can we quickly just turn to Romans 13? And then also we can find 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Romans chapter 13. Now, we won't have time to read it all in context. It's so important to read these things in context because Romans chapter 13, those first few verses are are in a, a huge debate amongst Christians today. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why, because to me, it's quite simple. But if you read it in context of Romans 12, or the whole book of Romans, <laughs> but, you know, from verse 9 of chapter 12, my label in my Bible says, behave like a Christian, okay? I love that, whoever wrote that there. I just want to give him a high five. <laughs> it's like, behave like a Christian. You know, how many times do you say, oh, these Christians are behaving so unchristlike, you know. But he tells us, love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly, affectionate. Friends, this is Christianity basics, should I put it that way, that we get wrong all the time, <laughs> all the time. Repay no one, e verse 17 of chapter 12. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place for wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Behave like a Christian. <laughs> in verse 21 of chapter 12. Do not, overcome e uh, over do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't chop off ears. <laughs> do you see? Then it goes into chapter 13, and Paul goes on and he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority, as Jesus helped Pilate understand, except from God. That's not changed. That is not changed changed. The most corrupt world leader that you might find today, if he's got authority, he's received that authority from God, he will answer to God for his actions. And our job as believers, if I understand the Bible correctly, is to pray for those who are in authority, whether we like them or not. We pray for their salvation, even. But I'm pretty sure even if they get saved, they'll probably get kicked out from that job. <laughs> You see, we're called to pray for them that we may live peaceably. Do you see, my friends, there's important two pillars of society that God put in place. They are called authority and submission. And without those two pillars in society, chaos ensues. It's not possible. God put those things in place. Any one of you that runs a household, any of you that runs a business or has oversight of anything, you know somebody's got to take the authority and somebody's got to submit. And at any time, that can change. I think in military sense, that can change. That's why a lot of people like hiring people that have been in the military because they know how to lead when they're called upon and they understand authority. But at the same time, if it should switch around, they know how to be led. 
because now this guy's in charge and I have to submit and other people's lives are at stake. I better not have a power struggle here. Do you see? These are vital ingredients that God put in place. We can't undo them. The world is trying to undo these things today. Not possible. No authority except they are appointed by God. And in verse 2, it's Romans 13. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. When we do good works, righteous acts of the saints, there's most world leaders would want those types of citizens, DC. <laughs> Even in communist China, we heard from a, a, a teacher that was there years ago, underground Christian school. And she said to us, you know, sometimes their pastor spends you know, weeks in prison and you know, he comes out again and they're back to prison again. But they run this Christian school all underground. But she said, the funny thing is the government knows about them. This was back years ago. I don't know what it's like there now. But she says, but they know about them. And every now and then, there would be a group of troubled youngsters who would be sent their way. <laughs> Just look after them for us, you know? Because they began to realize what they're doing is a good work and it has an impact on society. And although they're being persecuted, they were shouting a far bigger message by the good that they do. True Christianity. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister to an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Duh. People in corrupt countries hate that. <laughs> Wish they could take it out of the Bible. <laughs> but we pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually for this very thing, to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. To me, it's very simple. Please turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. One Peter chapter two from verse eleven, I think it is. Again, you know, you have to read this in context, but we'll pick it up in verse eleven. Notice the language Peter uses here. He says, Beloved, I beg you, I plead with you. I beg you as sojourners, as pilgrims. There's that kingdom mindset again, because our kingdom is not of this world. We are passing through this world. Our kingdom is above. I beg you, as sojourners, pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. There were these quiet, righteous Christians that just went about doing what Jesus taught them to do. Do you see? Even though nobody says anything about them at the time, but at the day of visitation, my friends, it'll be known. And then Peter goes on, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. But they don't do the good, Dion. They don't do what is right. I come from a corrupt continent, friends. They don't do the right things that they're supposed to do, but they are going to answer to God. Does that mean I rebel against them and I try to overthrow them and start a riot against them? No. No. God put them there. If they don't get it right, they can answer to God. We are called to submit and to pray. Do you see? For this is, friends, if you want to know 
So important for young people. I remember as growing up, all I, you know, I didn't know the scriptures well. I didn't know much about anything. Ignorant young man. <laughs> I used to tell my history teacher, I, I, I hate history. It's got no relevance or bearing on my life. I was just an ignorant. I'm in much ways, I still am an ignorant person. But God did a big work in me. But one thing I held on to tightly, I just want to do God's will. I just want to know what God wants me to do, and I want to do that. And that is a vital, vital ingredient. And there it says, what Peter's talking about here, it says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, not of this world, yeah, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice but as bondservants of God. Then Peter says, honor all people. <laughs> Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Friends, to me, it's black and white, it's clear. I have absolutely no issue with these chapters. I just want to, in the closing moments, we're going to run out of time, but something I haven't spoken about, I think much in this church, because I have been of the mindset, you know, where Paul says to Timothy, avoid ignorant disputes, they only generate strife. <laughs> so sometimes things will come my way, and I'll quickly want to calculate and pray in my mind. I'm like, Lord, is this an ignorant dispute? And then I begin to think it through, and I think all possible outcomes of this conversation is going to be strife. Okay, I'm going to avoid it. I'm stepping out <laughs> under Paul's authority. <laughs> okay. So if I've done that to you, I, well, I shouldn't apologize. But I try to, and I think this is good advice for all of us. If something comes across as an ignorant dispute, avoid it. It, it only generates strife, okay? Now, I've probably ap approached that with the vaccine argument, okay? You might think, Dion, you're very slow coming on board with this thing. <laughs> but I want to make this very clear as I say this this morning. I'm using the vaccine thing only as an example of where we're at as believers today. As I can see it, and I believe some other faithful pastors that I've heard and spoken to can see it. I'm not speaking about the vaccines as the issue yet because this is part of the bigger issue. Christians are gathering around issues and they're not gathering around the truth. But here's the one example, okay? Vaccine troubles, if you like, <laughs> because it's ongoing. And I think... Maybe if we just keep avoiding it, it'll go away. It's not going away. <laughs> okay? There's a fierce debate amongst believers today. And the debate turns into strife. It begins to lead to resentment. And friends, it leads to separation, even in households. And there have been churches that have been severely affected by this. Partly because pastors came out perhaps strong on one side of the argument or debates raged in the church. I don't know, but it's caused division. And when you look back and you see and you examine it and you see, well, who wants to divide the church, the body of Christ? There is only one body. There's only one spirit. Do you see? Where is it coming from? Okay, and this is what I believe the Lord has been showing me as we go along. A lot of times we make light of these issues today and just brush them aside and maybe have a giggle and a laugh because we have our differences. And we're not seeing what is happening in front of us. This is a vicious attack on the church that is causing carnage, friends. And we need to be strong on this issue. So I'm so grateful. I found one pastor. I just, by God's grace, he came up on my YouTube feed. Yeah, somewhere in the Midlands. I don't even know his name. I left him a comment. But just, and he was talking about something different, Laodicea. And I skipped through the message, and I just, he, at that moment, and he addressed this very issue. And I thought, oh, here we go again. And my jaw just dropped. And he said, you know, four categories. You know, the Christian, I'm talking about Christians now, okay? Christian vaccine troubles, if you like. Four categories. Two on the for the vaccines, two on the against the vaccines, okay? And I know they're all here, <laughs> okay? So don't throw things at me. But this is how I see it as an example for us. So those who are for the vaccines, they read two categories. You've got one category, those who read Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, and for them, it's the government has suggested this, they've put this out for us, we should just obey and get it done because of that, and we don't want to be in rebellion. And they take it, yeah? No problem for them. 
Second category of those who are pro-vaccines, or not pro, but they you know, take the vaccines, are those that still read Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, but they check and they see that these things, perhaps the spirit behind it, this is leading somewhere that it's making us uneasy. But because we can see it's not in the mark of the beast, <laughs> kind of clear on that issue, and though we don't like the way it's being handled, like many things governments do, and we don't like the spirit behind it, we don't like the control, we don't like the anger, the push behind it, but because they read Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, all right, I'll submit, trust you, I don't like it, yeah, like children, they'll tell you, <laughs> don't want to do it, but I'll do it, because you said so, and they submit, and they take it. Then you've got the, so don't take the vaccine, <laughs> okay? Two categories. This is very generalized, okay? So I know there's all kinds of spirals and all these things, so don't fight with me afterwards. Two categories for those that don't take the vaccine. Those that go on the internet and they read everything they can find, everything that's been sent to them, and they believe just about every word of it, and they say, that is it, I am not submitting to this government, I will not take it, I'm gonna turn into a cow, I'm gonna turn into a cyborg, or whatever it may be that you've learned and you've heard and you've read, okay? And they are aggressively, can I put it that way, resist. And on top of that, want to evangelize others on their stance, do you see? Now I want to say very clearly to us this morning, that category is the only one amongst the three, I'll give the fourth one now, that I believe is not acceptable in the body of Christ. Let me be very clear. Friends, I've let this go. Thinking it's an ignorant dispute is not acceptable in the body of Christ. It is toxic. It has caused damage. It's caused division. It is not of God. You have swallowed lies. And people, you know, many of us are guilty. We have flung these things to 50, 60, 100 people. Yeah? Think back of the 5G thing. <laughs> right at the beginning. How many emails went around? Never do you hear people come out and say, oh, what? I apologize. That's been proven false. But how many people have we infected by the things that we send around? And then the second category of those that don't take the vaccine. There are those who read the Bible, they understand prophecy, they see where things are leading, they're concerned that we are heading into the last days, we see a global government developing. They read Romans 13, 1 Peter chapter 2. Their hearts are broken. We need to submit to our governing authorities. But my conscience is telling me because what I'm reading in the Word of God I can't do it. And for now, I'm parking it. And I'm not doing it. But they do so respectfully. They do so lovingly. They say to their friends and their family, this is the decision I've come to. I've prayed about it. I'm talking to the Lord about it. I'm reading scriptures. This is the position I'm taking. Now I want to say to us this morning, one, two, and four, if I had a graph here this morning, I am happy to be, get along with anybody in those categories. But that third one is a problem. And friends, we need to begin to see it for what it is. Toxic, damaging, and it's not of God. That's one example. Just the vaccines. There are going to be more issues that come up in the coming days. We need to be absolutely sure who we are in Christ. And I want to say to, to all of us, just like Jesus said to Peter, put down the sword, put away your sword, put away your guns, put away your keyboard, put away your social media, okay? Your attack mode, <laughs> okay? This is where we fight these days, is behind our screens. And we send it to all of our contact list. We think there's a punch in the nose. I've done my bit. Jesus is not pleased with this behavior. This is one example. One example. Friends, I want to close. I know I've gone over time, but I just want to close with this as an example of what we are to be as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 4. I'll close with this.
Now, this is an interesting passage because Peter and John are arrested. Why? Because they're going around preaching the gospel. (laughs) And who gets angry and upset? It is the religious leaders of their day. And they get arrested. And they get told not to preach in the name of Christ anymore. So what do Peter and James, Peter and John do? They rebel (laughs) in the righteous way. How can we but not preach the gospel of Jesus? So they find themselves in prison. The saints pray for them. And I want to pick it up in verse 23, chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. I'll read chapter 4, verse 18, just so you you can understand. So, So they called them... Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge. (laughs) For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Do you see the experiential element here? If you are a true believer in Christ Jesus, there's an element of experience. You cannot but give your testimony. This is how you overcome Satan. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and you love not your life even to death. I cannot but tell you what God's done for me. He saved me. And eventually they let go. In verse 23 it says, And being let go, they went to their own companions. They went to the church and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, They raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. Friends, what a powerful example. Let's lay hold of this. If you take anything away from this this morning, this is the example that we should aspire to, the early church. Notice how they pray. You are God. You are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth, of your servant David have said, and he quotes Psalm chapter 2, that we, including myself, a lot of times reserve only for end time things. But according to early church here and their prayer, they saw this fulfilled in the time of Jesus. Read what it says. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And then they go on to pray, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. They weren't even friends at that time. Gospels tell us they became friends at the accusation of Jesus. They united both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. (laughs) I love that. Do you see it? All the things that are taking place, God is allowing these things to happen, friends. He's in control. He is in control. All by his purpose and his hand, these things will be done. And then they pray, they say in verse 29, Now, now, Lord, look on their threats and zap them from heaven (laughs) and put them in prison for putting Peter and John in prison. Sort them out, Lord. No. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. How? By stretching out your hand to heal. (laughs) To heal. We fight so much about the vaccines and all these things. The power of God in you is able to go lay hands even on somebody who's struggling with a virus or sickness. And you can heal by the power of God. Stretch out your hand and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And I love this. And when they had prayed the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. My friends, this tells me God 
was pleased by this prayer. God was pleased with his church. They had every reason to have hatred. They had every reason to demand justice. No, Lord, give your servants boldness. Oh, that we would change our prayers these days and we begin to pray for the evangelists. We begin to pray for our fellow brothers and sisters that when we go with our family and our friends and our workplaces, that we would speak the word of God in all boldness and that there would be authority and it would be followed by signs and wonders, something experiential. Not that it's only about that, but we know that salvation is the power of God unto salvation, do you see? May that be our prayer. Where is our fight, friends? Where is our fight? I ask us this morning. Is it with the governing authorities? Is it with the vaccine mandates? Is it with all these things? No, it's not. Go and study Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6, leading into that famous armor of God, militant passage. And read it in context again. And you see where the fight is. Husbands and wives, families, you know, uh, masters and bond servants. Again, all those pillars, authority and submission. Authority and submission. Authority and submission. When those things begin to get eroded, that's when we're losing the fight. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And put on the armor of God. Oh, may the Lord help us to have a renewed mindset, friends. As Jesus went to the cross, <laughs> you know, he, he agonized. The Bible says, he, Lord, if possible, let this cup pass from me but he knew he was on a greater mission. You and I are part of this great commission. Go and make disciples of all the nations, yeah? So I'm going to ask three people if they just want to help me distribute. Whoever feels led, just three, one, two, three. Uh, just grab a thing of the wine and, and the bread. And then we're going to take 